This is Think Tech Hawaii, Community Matters. Welcome. This is Craig Thomas, your host for Much More on Medicine, part of the Think Tech Hawaii live stream series. We're assisted today by Rich and Ray, our engineers, and our guest is Al Bronstein. Nice to see you again. Yes. Uh, Al is a medical toxicologist, and that's pretty cool, but relevant to today's discussion, he's the branch chief of the Emergency Medical Services uh, and injury, in injury Prevention part, which is crucial, of the Department of Health. Thanks for coming. Yes, thank you for having me, Craig. Yeah, I'm happy you're here. Uh, so to recap, the last few shows have been talking about various elements of the medical system and what's working, where are there are opportunities, and just to put it out there, my bias is there's gonna be a lot of change in medicine over the next few years because to date we've been mostly measuring our product by the amount of services provided rather than the outcomes we produce. And you're in charge of several key areas of the whole healthcare chain. What happens between the community and the hospital, how you keep bad things from happening in the first place, which probably has had less attention in the past than it should have, and honestly, what's working, what isn't. I'm interested in the right care in the right place. So uh, with that, I was hoping you'd sort of paint a picture of the current status and then particular challenges, maybe related to time or location or utilization patterns or need for, I don't know what, people, equipment, new ways of doing things, and also then lead into opportunities. So thanks again. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for having me here. I, I want to explain a little bit about the branch, the Emergency Medical Services Injury Prevention System branch, Department of Health, so it's a big word, a lot of words. Uh, we have a variety of responsibilities and it really is a spectrum for the state of Hawaii for both the residents and the visitors. The branch is responsible for the provision of all 911 emergency care throughout the state. And we, and we have we are responsible for management of the state trauma system, as well as we have an injury prevention program and the state poison center. So I should break it down a little bit. Absolutely. The, we have a very unique system in Hawaii where the state actually contracts with providers, designated providers for all 911 service throughout the state. This was done originally through the foresight of the legislature because if we did not do that, there would be small areas, very rural, that might not have 911 service. So I am happy to say, and this was done before my time, but I can say that there is 911 service statewide everywhere. Which is no mean feat because you range from Waikiki to Ka'u. Uh, it's interesting to me, you didn't mention it, that the state contracts with rather different entities depending yes. on which island you're on. Yes, I, yes, I was, yes, thank you, thank you. On Oahu, we contract with the city and county of Honolulu EMS. On the Big Island, it's with Hawaii County Fire Department. They're a combined fire and EMS service. And on Kauai and Maui, we have contracts with AMR a private company that provides a service for both counties. So it's a di different model on each, in, e in each county, but there is a unity in the model in that all of the providers use one electronic medical record system, which is transmitted to a central hub, so we have all the medical records in one place. Um, and the state uh, does the billing and collections for all services. So we are able to return about $42 million back to the state general fund, which uh, I think is very good, and, and this helps to defray the expenses are about a $75 million. So it's very important. So it's really a system, and we, are, we have looked at our rates here compared to the mainland, and and ambulance rates here are very economical. 
So uh, that's the overarching picture. We work very closely with the providers as well as Kapiolani Community College, which is the state's designated paramedic uh, training institution. So it's all one system and I am very pleased that all of the providers work together for the betterment of the entire state. Um, and so that's with the EMS system. Then of course we have eight trauma centers plus Tripler Army Hospital and they receive some state support. So it's a spectrum in that if there's an ax if there's a car crash or a heart attack, EMS takes care of the patient, taken to the hospital. If it's trauma, a car crash, we have the trauma center. And of course, on the other end, we have a very robust injury prevention program from senior fall prevention to drownings to suicide and to a, to a, a, a traffic program. Or so, Which is, of course, why you said car crash, car crash rather than car accident. That's the uh, new term, actually. I, They're not accidents. I, I, few things in life truly are. I mean, it may have been an accident. But there was probably some predisposition behind it, and that's, I know, part of your role in trying to figure out what is predisposing to sudden bad events and uh, trying to ameliorate it so they don't happen. And the same thing with exposures to poisons. We don't call them accidental exposures anymore. They're either intentional or they're unintentional because there aren't, some say there are no such thing as accidents like you alluded to. So in addition to the trauma system, the EMS system and injury prevention, we are responsible for the state poison center, which is a 24 hour number reachable by anyone toll free. I don't know how this will reject, but it's a toll free number 800-222-1222 24-7, confidential, calls are answered by specially trained nurses in medical toxicology, and they are backed up by medical toxicologists. So it's one of the few services where one can get a physician 24 hours a day, just like the emergency department. And I'd like to say, as <laughs> the denizen of the emergency department, uh, I have called it on numerous occasions. Uh, it's been very helpful. Sometimes the nurses are what I need, sometimes someone like yourself. And we also, of course, if someone in the community calls and are advised to come to see us, we get a heads up from the poison center saying, here they come, uh, let us know what you find, we need to talk about this, which is fabulous. So it's, it's a way of getting real resource uh, anytime, day or night. So thank you for being part of that. Well, thank you. And about approximately 20% of the calls come from emergency departments, our physician, our healthcare provider offices. So it's medical toxicology is a relatively small specialty, but this way we can provide a specialty that one wouldn't see a, a generally in a many in many localities. I'll tell you an amusing anecdote. The most recent time I called the poison center was for a uh, herbicide exposure on Palmyra. The uh, uh, victim thought that he had. Uh, Hepatitis is a consequence. We determined that actually if he had hepatitis, it was in his right lower quadrant and it was actually appendicitis. But uh, Poison Center uh, was helpful uh, because I needed to know the risk of hepatitis in this case and they gave it to me. It was low. So thanks again. You're welcome. Hawaii is a rather far-flung place. Palmyra is about a thousand miles from here, but it uh, works. Well, and through the poison centers were one of the original uh, telehealth systems, yes. which now is very much talked about using electronic modalities or remote presence to provide medical care. And poison centers have been doing this for a long time. And now, of course, we have new modalities with not only audio, but we can do video. And to move this along to the 21st century, as well as, as you know, we've talked about, someday I, we'd like to see telemedicine in the pre-hospital arena. Which is starting to happen on the mainland. Yeah. Uh, and there are some platforms that do that. And it, honestly, it seems really full of potential. We do a small amount of telehealth 
to remote islands like, for example, Palmyra or Curie, and it works. If you can get an image of something or a video clip and have a two-way conversation with a provider, uh, often with a different uh, training level, you can do a lot. Yes. And so uh, I think this has got tremendous potential. We have to have new ways of doing things. Well, and it's new and old altogether at the same time because if you remember when paramedics, when the specialty of paramedicine started in paramedics, they were known as the eyes and hands of the physician in the field. And they were connected back to the base station hospitals via the Medicom system. Right. Uh, I say mobile uh, radio system. And now we're going to the next stage. Not only do we have eyes and hands in the field, but we can virtually now bring the physician to the field, which is very, which is a new concept and I think will allow us to do a lot more with less. You're right. And I do remember those days because I trained at Harborview and uh, Harborview was at the forefront of that and uh, where a lot of uh, paramedicine was actually developed. So you're right. And my sense is, done properly, this could tremendously change what happens in the field. Not everyone needs to be transported to the emergency department. Uh, not everybody needs to be transported at all. Uh, but they do need input, uh, often from a, another resource, perhaps an emergency doctor, perhaps somebody else, uh, and a destination. So I'm excited about this. Right. It's true. Not everyone needs to go to the hospital. And the art is knowing who should go and who can stay at home or who can go to the clinic. Right. Because uh, it, anyone who's been in the hospital, hopefully not, but we know that uh, in, in, say, 10, 15 years ago, people stayed for a long time. Had a baby, it was like three days mandatory. When I was in training, three days. Now I think you know, there's even a law that put a minimum on it, which yeah, is gone now. Right, and so now it's much different recognizing there are limited resources and that people do better at home in their own environment with their family around them than in the hospital environment. I think that the thing that's becoming recognized that Every intervention needs to have benefit because they all have harm. And hospitals can certainly provide benefit, just like transportation and an ambulance can provide benefit, but not without the risk of harm. And uh, if there is little benefit that, say, a hospital can provide after a certain period of time or for many conditions, all that's left is harm. And even if there weren't harm, and there is, you can catch uh, diseases from your neighbor, things happen. They're also miserable places to be. There was a hilarious new study that came out that suggested, who knew, you don't get to sleep very well in hospitals. Uh, and anybody who's been in a hospital or with someone will know. There's the 1.30 blood draw, there's the 2 a.m. vital signs, there's the 3 a.m. Uh, code announcement overhead, there's a whatever. Um, Not to mention the food. Uh, that's a whole other topic which we should stay away from. Although as a toxicologist, you yeah. may be interested. <laughs> Sorry. But they have come a long way. Hospital food has improved. When I was an intern, we snuck into the hospital cafeteria after our, our kitchen after hours in hopes of scoring dinner, and all we found was jello. So oh. um, <laughs> okay. I felt bad for the patients, honestly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that the point of this conversation so far is do the right thing in the right place and minimize the chance for harm and, of course, maximize the value for the resource expended because currently 18% of GDP, that's another way of saying 18 cents on every dollar that the U.S. generates, goes to health care. Now, personally, I like my health. I'm okay with spending a lot of money on it, but that money needs to be well spent. And I think that compared to other countries, it could be argued we're spending a lot of money for middling results. Great things in some ways, not so good in others. And uh, we need to look at everything. Exactly. I think it's expectations, too, from the physician, the healthcare provider, to the patient. All that needs to be looked at. And and everyone needs to take more responsibility for their own health. 
I agree completely. And after the break, we'll resume on that theme because we're all in this together. We all have bodies. We need to take care of them, and we need to get uh, have access and use the help we need uh, when the time comes. So thank you. Uh, we'll be back in a minute. This is Craig Thomas on Much More About Medicine with Al Bronstein from the EMS branch of the State Department of Health. Thanks. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Welcome back. This is Craig Thomas on much more about medicine. And my guest is Al Bronstein from the Department of Health State uh, Emergency Medical Services Branch. And before the break, we were talking about the challenges of uh, responding to uh, patients' needs uh, across the state. And I think that it'd be nice to paint a picture of what's involved in doing that and kind of the people involved, the number of runs, the equipment. Uh, Describe for people what, what you've got to manage this diverse, complicated state. Okay, thank you. So as we mentioned before, each of the counties has a designated EMS provider for 911 service. In each county, the model is a little different. In the city and county of Oahu or Honolulu, it's through Honolulu EMS. And uh, on Maui and Kauai, it's AMR. On the Big Island, it's Hawaii County Fire EMS. So roughly, we have this nice brochure that was actually prepared by city and county EMS of, uh, of Honolulu, which shows the history of the responses through the state over the years. And it's probably a little hard to see on the television, but we get about 140,000 responses per year. And I'd point out that's gone from 125,000 in 2012, so you've picked up more than 20,000 annual uh, response calls uh, in the last five years. Exactly. The rate's between 3 to 5% a year, and these are both residents and the visitors. One of the things that's very important for Hawaii as a destination vacation site is that we can assure visitors that they can get the same 911 care should they require it that they can get on the mainland. And I think that is very important for people who come to the state to visit to know. And about approximately 80% of these responses end up in transport to hospital. And of course, the, the numbers are increasing because our population uh, is aging. There's an increasing homeless population, as well as well as um, there are in, there are people who uh, utilize the, the system several several times in a given in a given month or year. You know, uh, a couple things I'd like to circle back on. One is, on the order of twenty percent of your uh, calls, don't respond result in a transfer for a variety of reasons. Maybe nobody's there, maybe somebody refuses, but clearly there's an opportunity. The other thing I'd like to touch on, and you mentioned a couple categories, people without other resource, including sadly a place to live, but also those of us who are getting old, uh, tend to be what we call in the emergency department, low acuity, high complexity. Uh, what that means is, maybe not too medically ill, and in fact, not likely to benefit from a medical intervention, 
but doesn't mean things are working. And uh, whether can't get out of bed or can't do any of a number of other things or needs some rather low-tech intervention um, or maybe just a place to stay. In fact, when I was a resident, we used to give lobby passes so people wouldn't freeze. I know you were in Denver. You were aware of this phenomena. Um, the, in fact, <laughs> this was long ago before some regulations, and we used to up front like, hey, Joe, I know it's cold tonight. Are you sick or are you cold? Because if you're sick, we'll take care of you. And if you're cold, we'll give you a lobby pass. We'll get you a sandwich and a hot coffee, and you get to hang out there tonight because it's cold out there. Well, there's a lot of that. Not, not cold here, but other needs. And so there have to be other ways of intervening. And we don't, where we need to think creatively is that the traditional medical model doesn't always fit. Exactly. And sometimes we attempt in our zeal to help people to put them into the medical model so that, for instance, every headache that comes to the emergency department is not a simple to be muscular tension headache, it's something much more a severe or has to be ruled out. And uh, we, the medical model is appropriate sometimes and it's not so appropriate other times and we need to know, we need to pick the right treatment for the right patient and that's not always easy and people have been struggling with this and this has given rise to the idea of not only can paramedics respond for 911 care or emergencies, car crashes, trauma, heart attacks, strokes, uh, they can, we can also have what's known as the community paramedic that works with people who have more chronic medical problems such as diabetes, asthma, high blood pressure, recent discharges from the hospital to keep them from going back to hospital. And so this is a new field that we're hoping and we want to bring to Hawaii. And I do want to say there are certain medical issues or conditions that do merit 911. And for instance, a stroke. We know that the more and more the literature is showing, the sooner the patient gets to the hospital, the sooner interventions can be begun and, the, and we can save brain tissue. Time is tissue. So we also know that, and I'm guilty of this myself, I don't want to call the ambulance. I want to take myself in. But first, things like strokes or the, the arm doesn't move quite right, my speech isn't quite right, I'm not thinking quite right. It's time to call 911. Don't delay, as we say, call 911. Don't come in by private car. And the other reason to do that is the paramedics will notify the hospital through our communication system and say, we have a patient who is showing signs of a possible stroke. And then the hospitals activate the stroke team. So when the patient gets there, everything is done very precisely to diagnose as quickly as possible. Now obviously not all things are a true stroke, which is good, but it's hard to tell sometimes. So we really urge people for strokes, heart attacks, chest pain, uh, call 911. Don't, don't try to brave it by private car. Don't wait till the family comes home if, because time is tissue for both strokes and heart attacks and the sooner we can intervene, the better the outcome. Absolutely, and uh, so a couple things about that. Uh, Hawaii, I think, culturally, people are, are definitely alert about, uh, don't wanna make A, right? And so, about 20 years ago, this was a big problem because instead of calling, dispatch was getting calls from Boston. And, because uh, what would happen is someone would be having a stroke, let's say, their spouse would call their family to say, what do you think we should do? And their family would call Hawaii Dispatch. That's not how it should work. So I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, fire trucks, the police cars, don't stall, call. That's where that slogan arrived. And I think it's better, but still, speed is of the essence. Guys in particular have trouble admitting reality, so 
we need to remember this ourselves. The other thing you alluded to is an opportunity to plug telemedicine, which is not only do the crew perform some screening maneuvers in the field and assess the likelihood of, for example, a stroke uh, and alert the hospital, but that's the hospital's cue, not only to make sure there's no one in the CAT scan device or get them out of it so that it's ready, but to queue up often the tertiary stroke center via telemedicine link. Most of the uh, outlying hospitals across the state are connected to the tertiary stroke center. And this is important because then you can decide, because the treatment, valuable, is also dangerous. And also, if it doesn't work, there's sometimes other options. So queuing that up early is, is huge. Yes, so, so, we, so we emphasize that. And telemedicine can be used for, for more mundane problems, although there are problems like wound care, yes. asthmatics, uh, where the physician can see the wound. Maybe it's a simple uh, treatment that doesn't require coming into hospital or to the doctor or to the office, and, and the paramedic can start the treatment, and then the paramedic can go back and follow up on the patient, and then show the progress of the wound to the physician. And it's almost like a house call. You know, we don't have house calls very much anymore. So, but this is a high-tech house call. It's pretty cool. So that's what we like to move to, and, and uh, hopefully we can start some projects. There's a bill in the legislature now. I was going to ask you about that. To fund a Tell pilot. Um, both, it's a pi would be a pilot on Oahu, so a metropolitan area, and one of the neighbor islands. And to evaluate exactly how to, cr to create it for Hawaii. There are several models on the mainland, and we really need to understand what fits the state the best. You know, that's exciting. We're going to have to have you back to talk about that. Okay. Uh, the, you get a brief thing to put out your ask. What else do you need? And then we're going to wrap this up until next time. Well, thank you. Well, the other thing we need, we need three new ambulances. We need an ambulance on Oahu, Kauai, and the Big Island. I understand it. Uh, I work on all three islands, and I think you're exactly right. You know, it's been a pleasure to have you here. I want to talk more about a number of these topics. We'll have to do it again. Thank you. Uh, so this is Craig Thomas with Al Bronstein from the EMS Branch State Department of Health, and we're wrapping up for today on much more on medicine. Thanks for attending and listening. <laughs>